Work is changing. The question is, are you? Welcome to 99 Problems But Work Ain't One, the new podcast series from How Now that will help you prepare for the fast changing world of work. I'm your host, Nelson Sivalingam, and I'll be talking to disruptive startups, contrarian thinkers, global leaders, and real game changers, and asking them the burning questions about the challenges we face at work, from scaling cultures and adopting technology, to improving well-being and building fast learning organizations that are prepared for the future of work. We get the insights, tactics, and actionable nuggets of knowledge to put to work. Have you heard about the free LMD elephants in the room? They're not the things we never forget, but the ideas we often overlook. Paul Matthews joins me this week to talk us through learning transfer, building capability and informal learning, plus the sneaky fourth elephant. Paul's got so much L&D experience we could fill an episode with his backstory, but in a nutshell, he's an industry expert. He's written three L&D books, he's a regular speaker at events, a consultant, a strategist, more importantly, he breaks down L&D challenges in a relatable and applicable way. From how L&D can become better performance consultants to building the credibility needed to drive real change, this is a must listen for any L&D and people leaders. Hi Paul, thanks for joining us. Hi, oh, yeah. it's great to be here. Um, and so look, today's chat um i really wanted to kind of focus around the three elephants in the room the physical room the virtual room but the three elephants are what we're going to talk about and this is really what you've kind of widely written about in your in your free books and, and a lot of your work is centered around these three elephants and so why don't you start off by telling us what these three elephants are well there's actually four of them because there's a fourth sneaky one so okay uh... <laughs> Um, I I started writing my book on learning transfer, which is actually my third book, and and I started using the the term the elephant in the room for learning transfer because it's something that a lot of learning and development people are aware of but almost studiously ignore when they're going about doing their learning and development initiatives. Um, And that obviously got me thinking, you know, are there any other elephants lurking in the same room? And I realized there are a couple more. And strangely enough, they align very well with the first two books I wrote. So I ended up talking about the three elephants uh, as the three books that I wrote. Um, Yeah. And and then, as I said, there's a fourth sneaky one. And I'm I'm calling it sneaky because I don't want to write a book on it. I've written three (laughs) books up enough. Well, um, not if we, we we can force you to write another one. But <laughs> let, 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 let's take it from, I guess, the order in which the kind of elephants entered the room. Um, well, the, so, the first one, as I said, was the learning transfer elephant, even though uh, that was the first one that I sort of noticed or started describing that way. Right. Um, and oh, by the way, in Brazil, they have an expression, the goat under the table, which means the same thing. So uh, <laughs> which is kind um, of cool. So but, let's uh, pick up le- learning learning transfer is the kind of first one we talk about. I guess, firstly, w- why do you think it is an elephant in the room? You know, what, why is it being ignored and not being talked about as, as much? Well, it's an elephant because it's got a massive impact on, on, on what anybody does in learning and development. Um, and, and so, therefore, it's one of those things that you really can't ignore. But people do because it's... Uh, it's because it's typically always been in the background. People haven't ever paid much attention to it, so it's become habitual not to. Um, and it's also because it can be a little difficult making a start. Well, where do I start? How do I deal with this? Well, you know, what do I do with this elephant? So even when someone says, "Look, look, elephant over there," um, they say, "Oh yeah, yeah, we you know we kind of know about that," and then they go back to talking about bums on seats or rolling it out to the international audience or and they just disappear back into content delivery um, which is mostly where they sit um, with little, and, and so, little thought to to kind of how is that content going to make a difference in the real world out there in a practical world in terms of how people do their job and just on that Paul, how would you you know just start off with define learning transfer um there's, there's a lot of different definitions about. I've read a lot of different papers on it. But if you kind of pull them all together, it's really make sure that people do something after a training course with what they learned on the training course. So it's about operationalizing what they've learned. And, and of course, if they don't 
um, make that learning active in some way and utilize it effectively in their in their work in their job, then the learning was kind of wasted uh, if it's not going to get used. So that's really what it is. So it's not just about the transfer itself from the training, the point of training, whether that's a physical or virtual classroom or e-learning or whatever. Um, and we're talking about formal uh, learning interventions here. So, yeah. um, so there's that point of training or learning or whatever it is. And, and then uh, it, there's much more than just moving that from A to B. It's, it's moving it from A to B and then doing something with it. And it's yeah. the doing something with it that most people fall down on. I mean, there are some systems out there which focus on making sure that people memorize stuff, but that's still kind of useless if they do nothing with what they've memorized, even if they've, you know, memorized it because they keep getting bombarded with text messages or this or that or the other. And kind of like, well, who cares if you're not going to use it? That still doesn't matter. And, and so. do you think this is due to the, the kind of challenges of implementing learning transfer from the perspective of kind of creating opportunities where learners can apply what they've learned in a relevant context or do you think this is more a case of the data infrastructure for measuring um the kind of impact of learning transfer isn't there and therefore they're not able to see you know what the what the benefits would be of um driving learning transfer where do you think the problem lies i think it's probably a bit of both i think the biggest problem is there's no central point of accountability for a training course having results right because the, the trainer says, well, I'm responsible for pouring this stuff into their heads. And, you know, I'm, I'm being yeah. a bit flippant there, but that's kind yeah. of a jug and mug approach. That's what the trainer is doing. Yeah. The, the manager says, well, I sent them on a training course. They should come back fixed and able to do stuff. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, the, other, the other stakeholders are, are equally at a distance. So there's no one place where all of those different responsibilities are collated together and no one's held responsible for uh, a training course to have any concrete result in terms of what happens because the manager says well I sent them on a training course they still can't do the job it's not my fault if they can't get trained and the trainer yeah. says well I got them I gave them what we were supposed to give them and they've gone back to their work I'm, my job's done you know so I think that's one of the reasons there's this David Wilson um, calls it the conspiracy of convenience. Everybody says, well, I've done my bit, and yeah. that's all I really want to get involved with. So I think that's one reason is that central point of accountability is not there. Um, the other thing is that people are unsure where to start, because you said giving them a chance to practice. Well, that's fine, but there's also what's, what are all the motivational issues going on for the learner? Do they want to learn? Can they be bothered learning? Is there something in it for them? So there's the mindset of the learner. Are they ready to learn? Do they think they can? Do they think they've got enough support? Can they be bothered? All the rest of it. Um, and, and then there is all of the design of your the program to set it yeah. up so that there are pieces in place for and opportunities for learning. So there's a roadmap, there's a plan, there's a journey that people are going to go on because by and large, you're wanting behavior change out of training. And of course, yeah. behavior change doesn't happen in an event it, it, unless you get some incredible road to Damascus conversion. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, it, it, you, you will need a sequence of things happening over time in order for behavior to change uh, and certainly to change effectively. Uh, yeah. And then the other thing is all the, the other stakeholders around them, you know, who's involved with, you know, their manager is going to be involved, their peers. There's all sorts of other people that have an input that is necessary in order for learning transport to, to, to go well. And, and do you have examples where, where you've seen learning transfer done well? And, and also, you know, what are the kind of tangible benefits you've seen when this has been done well? And it's been, like you said, there's the right kind of accountability in place. It's been factored into the actual learning uh, experience design. Um, yeah, a any examples? I've not seen it done really well. I've seen right. people do bits of those things I've mentioned. And whenever they do, they always get better results. But there's more that can be done. So I, I don't, I've never come across anybody who's doing it really, really well. Um, right. And kind of pulling all the levers that need to be pulled. So where do you think, you know, someone working in an L&D uh, team at the moment, listening to this uh, podcast, what, what's the kind of first step they can take in the direction of kind of effective knowledge transfer? What, what, what would you recommend they do first? 
Well, I'd, I'd, I'll challenge your phrase there, knowledge transfer, to start with, because that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking knowledge transfer is much more like an educational thing, where you're talking about transferring knowledge to someone who then maybe wants to pass an exam. What right. we're doing here is different. And even learning transfer is not an ideal term, but it's kind of what we're stuck with, given what the industry sure. uses. Um, so, so those aren't to be mixed up, I would, sure. would, would hasten to add. Um, but in terms of the first step, I suppose it's very self-serving, but read my book on learning transfer. Um, and also that references three or four other books that are companion reading to it, where I would also recommend that people go to. Um, and yeah, there's a few, few videos on my website and stuff like that. But there are not that many people out there really focusing hard on learning transfer. Um, right. It, it's, which I find staggering. Um, my background's engineering, and right. you know, you, you kind of want results out the other end. If you, if you design a bit of machinery, you don't want it to break. That's a failure. And yet, so many people go through formal training or formal learning, and effectively, it's a failure because they do so little, if anything, with it afterwards. Yeah, and, and so let's move on to kind of the, the next elephant in in the room. Which one do you, do you want to go to? Do you want to go to uh, informal well, think- learning or capability? I think the the capability one may be, um, which is my second book, so kind of working backwards here, and that's much more about the diagnostics process of uh, if someone does come and ask for training, which is a very common occurrence, the manager will rock up to training and development or the learning and development department said, I want, you know, two days of negotiation skills training for my call center team or whatever. And that's a real example I've actually come across. Um, yeah. And, and what they need to do is have a way to respond to that without just taking the order and then delivering that training without any thought as to why is this training and not some other training is training even required and all of that so i think there's two different steps and i think a lot of people get them mixed up the first step really is performance consultancy or performance diagnostics is sitting down and saying okay these people are not doing things the way we would prefer them to be doing them so why not? What's going on? What are the barriers? What are the causes? What's underlying this uh, behavior that we would prefer to be different? Um, yeah. And, that and is this... really, that's a performance diagnostics or performance consultancy. A lot of L&D people think they do that, but they don't. Because what they do is they go into that conversation assuming there's going to be a learning initiative or output from And so they end up going in doing what I call learning consultancy, which is assuming there's going to be a learning solution to whatever problem that gets presented to them. That first step of performance consultancy is required first, where you're not presupposing there's a learning solution. And you might end up doing that and saying they know what they need to know. Training isn't going to help. So in that case, there's no point in training them. Yeah, you might want to do that. I can relate to uh, this, Paul. I mean, it reminds me a lot of um, Steve Blank's kind of customer development methodology when you're kind of building products uh, and the idea of, you know, you you don't start with your kind of solution and product, you're starting with the user and the problem. And, and it's a, you know, methodology for effective user interviews to actually understand what problem you're solving and then to kind of ideate around the solution. And, yeah. and I can definitely see, you know, with my experience of what I've seen within the LD world, sometimes we, we start from the format first. Like you, from the get go, you know it's going to be classroom training. And now with that box, you're trying to, to solve the user's problem. And, and do you find the same? It's the fact that we're kind of stuck with the format first and trying to fit the solution within the, the bounds of the format? It's very, very common. Um, it, it doesn't mean they're starting with classroom training. What it means they're starting with learning solutions. Right. And it's the Abraham Maslow quote, if someone has a hammer, they assume everything you know, looks like a nail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's why learning and development people are often quite poor at going into that performance consultancy conversation because they go in with a very big hammer and, and called learning and development initiatives. And they might end up coming out the other end with action learning or coaching or whatever. But if it was a process improvement thing that needed happening, that that call center one I mentioned earlier as an example, two days of of, uh, negotiation skills training, they actually ended up after going through a proper consultancy process, changing the script and it did everything they wanted to do. They didn't need negotiation skills training, never did. 
But yeah. that was the B that was in the bonnet to the manager. So that was what he wanted to do. So what they want and what they need are two different things very often. And what yeah. they come to L and D is, well, I want this, but it's not what they need. So I think that whole the elephant in the room basically is having that conversation with that person requesting what they want and helping make sure that they have visibility of what they truly need. And yeah. then in all likelihood, they will say, oh, oh, that thing I used to want, I don't want that anymore. Now that I can see what I need, I want that thing that I need. And yeah. then you've got a chance of delivering something that will actually have some impact. Um, so so what, what do you think L&D teams can do from a, from a perspective of their own learning and, and kind of skills development to become better performance consultants? Um, uh, read my book. I think <laughs> um, there are a number of books out there in this kind of um, area. Um, and the, I think it's just important they realize they've got to go into that conversation not thinking about learning and development. They've got to go in with a very open mind and thinking, okay, we've got this bunch of people. They're not doing what we want them to do. What do we want them to do instead? So what's the behavior gap? And then another powerful question there is, well, if we don't do anything about this for six months, what's it going to cost the organization? 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, I don't know. And chances are, they A, they won't be able to tell you what behaviors they want instead of the current ones. They won't be able to define that very well at all. And B, they won't be able to give you an idea of what it's going to cost. So then the question is, well, hang on, you're not ready to have this conversation yet, Mr. Manager. You need to really think about yeah. these things because I need to know kind of what's the value in doing something for you as opposed to some, some other manager who's got a bigger, more pressing problem that's going to be worth more or cost more to the company. And also, until you can tell me what behaviors you want out the other end, I, there's not much I can do. Um, yeah. you know? And once we've got some idea of that behavior gap, then we can start looking at a performance consultancy thing saying, given we want these new behaviors, what's stopping the new ones occurring right now? So that's this diagnostics process of why aren't they doing that behavior right now? There's, there's a yeah. photograph I've got of a, um, of a donkey on a cart, and it's been lifted up in the traces of the cart. So it's actually lifted off the ground. Right. Um, because someone's overloaded the cart back end right. heavy, so the donkey's got its feet off the ground. Now, what you might say is that donkey's not doing his job. We need to send it to donkey school. <laughs> uh, you know, it needs training on how to pull a car. Well, actually, yeah. donkey school isn't going to help that donkey. Uh, there's yeah. a manager that's, you know, that's, that's misbehaving there. We need to fix the manager and teach the manager how to load the car. Then the donkey will be fine. So yeah. it's a matter of dig, diagnostically digging into the barriers that are causing the lack of behavior change or causing the, the, the absence of the behaviors that you're seeking. So yeah. that's why you need to do what I call a behavioral needs analysis or a task analysis to actually start driving out what's the set of behaviors that we want. Now, what are the barriers to the behaviors? How can we trigger them? How can we promote them? And typically 70, 80% of the things that you can do are nothing to do with learning and development. There will be things yeah. like process improvement, improving IT, tweaking a software system, getting, you know, um, making sure the right information's on the file server in the right place. All of those kind of things, um, uh, you know, are, are usually much more relevant to fixing those kind of performance problems. Now, if you go through that process and determine, yes, some kind of uh, uh, skills or, 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 or knowledge is required, then you are into potentially a learning and development scenario. Then you can start doing learning consultancy after you've done the performance consultancy right. and proven that there is potential for learning to be part of the solution overall. Yeah, um, I, I, I think from what you've just said, Paul, I can see why the, the sneaky fourth elephant came in because it, it does sound like it's well, not I just a case of... Yet. Well, I, 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 can, I can see why the, the kind of idea of... I know what it is, right? In terms of the rebrand element, because it is a case of not just L&D... Um, almost changing its approach and purpose, but also the entire business changing its perception and understanding. You know, when, when you're talking about the, the manager 
really being clear in, in the needs and, and what are the behavior changes they need and almost reevaluating what their relationship is with the LD team. But anyway, I'm dropping ahead and we can come to the sneaky fourth yeah, one yeah. Um, shortly. But let, let's go to the, the third one, um, which is informal learning. And you know, from, from my experience of working with various organizations, uh, I still find informal learning is a under utilized uh, approach or, or methodology it's still we still see a lot of um top-down formal structured learning but it'd be great to first get your kind of definition of what you define as kind of informal learning and kind of take it from there well i mean the cop out is saying informal learning is anything that's not formal <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, and, and I kind of stick with that because formal learning is much easier to define. It's scheduled, it's planned. In some way, you're saying this event is a learning event or learning is a primary output from whatever, um, or we're doing some e-learning or, or whatever. So uh, anything else other than that. And the research, the numbers, the various things show that a huge proportion of what people learn in order to do their job comes from uh, outside of the formal learning track. Uh, in other words, informal or non-formal or whatever you want to do it. People bandy yeah. about various percentages and all sorts of things. I, I don't really care much. I just yeah. know that a, a huge proportion, I don't know, 70, 80, 90, you know, sometimes 100%, depending on, you know, people's time and job and so on, comes from, um, you know, the, the, what they do during the day, how they observe others, the discussions they have, the things they learn, the bits they look up on YouTube, you know, on an ad hoc basis, all of that sort of stuff. So, and, and people get very, uh, I don't know, angsty about, well, is this formal or is this informal? I, it doesn't matter. It's just learning. It's just helping people do their job. But what's really important is to recognize that the vast majority of learning that people do in order to do their job happens on the job in while they're doing their work, in the flow of work. And so consequently, learning and development needs to be paying attention to that. Um, I, th I think that's the most important thing. And then there are ways to utilize it to harness the power of it, because it's a very powerful form of learning. It's the way we've always learned long before we had any kind of formal learning. Informal yeah. was all there was. Um, yeah. And unless you were talking about, you know, a family of cave people sitting around their fire and telling stories, you might consider that yeah. formal schooling back then. But, but basically the formal is very new to us. So as a, as a structure built for our neurology it's not right you know so yeah. uh, and, and like you said Paul, like you know every every organization has a learning culture right good or bad progressive or non-progressive every organization has a learning culture and like you said people are um already doing this you know we are already sharing knowledge between each other on tools like slack and teams and we're probably you know reading blogs listening to podcasts and doing all of the informal learning i guess the challenge for l d teams is like you said how do you harness the power of informal learning to help you drive um real impact whether that's business performance or behavioral change and and so how would you recommend um you know l d teams do that how do they harness that power for it to drive business goals oh there's, there's a few there's a few ways to do that um a is to be aware that informal learning is happening to go out there and find out survey people and saying well if this happens where do you go to find out that's the question you know do you go to a colleague do you do this do you know what are the resources and then to make sh to try and smooth that path for them to make sure that the information is more readily available it's fewer clicks away it's more readily accessible the internet's better you know and then publish other places they can look for similar information and so on so it's about so that's one side of it the other thing is to start utilizing informal learning in a purposeful way so rather than grease the wheels of what's already happening you can say well actually we need people to learn about this uh, so here's a specific output that we want from a learning perspective so what we can do is give people some tasks to go and do and send them a way to do them. And over there, out of our site, they are learning informally while they're doing those tasks. And then we bring them back to debrief them on those tasks. So it's kind of like tasking them from a, like a coach might do to a coachee. Yeah. And 
what you're starting to do is you're bridging that gap between formal and informal by sort of a halfway house and saying, here's some tasks to do, go and do them and then come back. Um, the, the problem when a lot of people get involved with uh, uh, informal learning is they try and manage it too tightly. And in doing so, they throttle it. It's a bit like holding a butterfly in your hands. If you hold it too tight, it's not good for the butterfly. Yeah. Um, and if you hold it too loose, of course, it just flies away. So you've got that, that happy middle ground. Um, and, and I think that's important with informal learning is that you can't hold it too tight. But what you can do is start directing little bits of it in specific areas of learning. And that's what I mean by this tasking, send them away to go and do something. And yeah. while they're over there, they will be learning informally while they're doing it. But you have no idea what they're learning or how fast they're doing it or if yeah. they're even learning anything until you bring them back. So it's a bit like let go of control while they go and do it and then reassert control when you bring them back to debrief it. So that's one way you can start harnessing informal learning in a formal way, if you want to talk about yeah. it. You know, yeah. So, and, yeah, and that seems like oh, it requires a culture shift because uh, quite often in the conversations we have, what we find is you know, it's quite different to the way they might be doing learning now, which is, say, predominantly formal, quite top-down, um, quite one size fits all and therefore to move to a environment where you don't necessarily have that control over what someone is looking at you're not tracking you know everything they read and watched and listened to and you don't have that kind of granular data to it and, and also if you're bringing in knowledge sharing and, and learning from each other there's this whole idea of do we approve everything that's shared, you know, within our learning platform? And so there's this idea of kind of micromanaging and control that seems to require a bit of a culture shift. And how do you think LD teams can, or organizations in general can bring about that culture shift? Um, well, I think a lot of that data you're talking about is valuable, but not that valuable. Because just because yeah. people read something doesn't mean they're going to do anything with it. And they might have actually opened up that document and then gone and got a coffee and never spent that much time with it at all. So I think it's really important to, to start just getting an idea of what we're trying to do. And that comes back to that behavioral needs analysis again. What behaviors do we want? How do you trigger the change in people in order for them to start doing those new behaviors? That's almost certainly going to be them experimenting and practicing some skills in order to build them up into behaviors. Um, which inevitably means you're going to end up needing some kind of workflow solution. And I don't mean in the workflow, I mean workflow in the true sense of an orchestrated sequence of tasks that's done sequentially to get people from where they are to where you need them to be. So it's a bit like the turn by turn instructions on your sat nav. Once the blue line's on your screen, you know you're going to get to Edinburgh if you put Edinburgh in as a destination. But the yeah. turn by turn instructions have been designed. And if you follow them, you will get there. So if you have your behavioral needs analysis and you know the set of behaviors you want out the other end of some kind of learning initiative, given you've, you've proven that's there, or even if it isn't a learning initiative, you know the sequence of things that are going to have to happen in order for people to be able to start exhibiting those behaviors by, you know, because you've removed the barriers. So what are all the step-by-step -step things that need to happen? Yeah. Um, and so if you can design that step-by-step -step set of tasks, that will get people behaving the way you want them to behave yeah. and they follow those set of tasks, then you will get the resultant behavior change that you want. Yeah. So that's where you've got to work from the behaviors and work backwards. And behavior change requires a workflow solution, not a learning solution. Although learning might be part of one or two of the steps, but there'll be far more other steps in terms of experimentation, practice, and, uh, and, and collaborative things and all sorts of other stuff and informal learning will all be part of that. And so yeah. informal learning is a core part of learning transfer. It's a core part of people getting behavior change because most of what people learn in order to change their behavior happens when they're doing stuff on their own or, you know, or with colleagues. It's not when there's a trainer in the room. Yeah. Um, so, so you're back to that behavior change and then work backwards. Whereas most L&D people start, well, we better do some management. So what they do is they say, what a managers need to know, here's the content list, and then yeah. they develop a set of content. But it's the wrong approach completely. It's, it's all yeah. backwards. And, and so let, let's come to our stinky fourth elephant 
And um, so, okay. so, so, so why, why don't you tell us what, what the sneaky fourth is? Although well, I, I, I let the cat yeah. out. The, Go on. I mean, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about is a little bit different. It, it's and and most people I've talked about saying, well, that makes sense. Yeah, we should be doing that. And but they don't. And one of the reasons they don't is they actually don't have a high level of credibility in the organisation. So they have difficulty having a conversation saying we need to change the way we do things now. Mm-hmm. And, and so, therefore, it is the credibility of L&D that will have a big impact on how well they're able to serve the organization effectively. And so that, the fourth sneaky elephant to me is the brand and reputation, which are slightly different things, but they're correlated, is the brand and reputation of L&D. And in most organizations, it's not very good. Or it's certainly, it's not that it's bad necessarily, but it doesn't help them do what they need to do. And it certainly doesn't help them promote changes in the way learning is happening and promote changes to, as you said earlier, every learning, every culture has a learning organ, has a learning culture of the organization. So, you know, how can they start focusing on, on changing that culture? And that requires change. And the people that can generate change and trigger change best are those with good credibility. So yeah. that's one L&D needs it. Um, and, and so, so that's what the you- sneaky elephant. And so what do you think, Paul, you know, someone listening to this now, what are the immediate things they can do to essentially give um, L&D a rebrand or, or to create a learning brand within their organisation? Well, it's, it's, it's probably more than a brand. It's, it's more than the logo. So there's a few steps that need to be taken somewhat iteratively there. Um, one is to sit down and do a value proposition for L&D, and just like a marketing department would do for the products. What's our value proposition for product X or product Y? Uh, L&D needs to sit down and say, who's our audience? And what is our value proposition for that audience? And there might be several different audience segments. Uh, and so, and, and, they, and that's just a standard business process. There's lots of different value proposition sort of tools and models out there. So that's what they need to be doing to start with. And then once they figured that out, they can say, okay, given that and our positioning in the organization, what is our mission, vision, purpose in L&D? And how do we link them to the greater vision, mission, purpose of the organization? So in a sense, our job is to ensure people are competent to step up to the line and execute the corporate strategy, whatever that is. So that's you know, we've got to assume that's right. That's been handed down from on high. So if that's wrong, we're all kind of in the wrong boat, but hang on. Yeah. <laughs> but let's assume that's right. So how do we as learning and development ensure that we have people competent to step up in the right kind of timeframes to deliver on that corporate and, and execute that corporate strategy? So, yeah. so, that's, so that's, it's kind of a roundabout answer, but there's the value proposition work and then you've got to do your vision, mission, purpose and stuff for L&D and self, and then work out a strategy of how we're going to deliver that. And obviously, all of that's got to be aligned with and plugged into the greater uh, things that are going on at a business level. Um, right. So you've got to talk to the business and all that. You know, so, and, and then you can start saying, we now understand who we are. This is what we're going to present to the organization. So your L&D strategy and the vision, mission, purpose kind of documents or statements might well have two different versions, one for internal use in L&D and then one for publishing out of the organization saying, this is yeah. who we are, this is what we will do for you, and this is how we can do it. And then you've got to make sure all the touch points that you have with the organization actually fulfill the promise in that brand because yeah. a brand is effectively a promise. A brand says, we will do this for you. When you see a brand, you know what the promise is. You know what to expect from that brand, from that logo. So yeah. your brand is your promise, but your reputation is based on the touch points that you have. And of course, if the touch points don't fulfill the promise, then you've got a disconnect between your reputation and your brand, and then things start going down the toilet kind of fast. So, And, and do you find, Paul, as a part of this rebranding exercise, do, do you see kind of L&D restructuring. And the reason why I ask this is some of the hyper growth um, you know, new tech unicorn companies that we work with, we see that they're starting to build in um, performance enablement or performance support teams into each function. So you might get it for, uh, you know, in the same way you might have DevOps, but you're now starting to get more kind of performance. So how do we make sure our engineers have the skills 
uh, knowledge and the behaviors they need to be able to deliver what the business needs. The same thing for sales, you've always had kind of a sales enablement, but it's moving more towards sales enablement, looking after that kind of performance support and learning piece for the, for the sales function. Do you see a restructuring happening as a part of this rebranding exercise? It might or it might not. Um, but what you've got to do is not just put veneer on something that's broken. So clearly, right. if it's broken, it, you know, it's like the lipstick on a pig type of thing. That's not going to work terribly well. So you, you need to make sure that the structure that is in place that is there and able to deliver on the strategy that you have decided is the appropriate strategy going forwards. Uh, yeah. And you may find that the current structure can do that, in which case that's fine. Uh, yeah. you know, if the bank broke, don't, necess- you know, don't necessarily break it or fix it. So, yeah, um, yeah. But, but often it does uh, mean some kind of restructure. And typically in larger organizations, it does. Um, and, and often when there's an HRBP type of uh, uh, structure from HR, because there you're getting HR business partners who aren't necessarily L&D trained and they're not having the right conversations at the right point. They're not having those performance consultancy conversations, for example. So yeah. what you want around learning and development is almost like a, a filter so that uh, requests that come in go through that performance consultancy filter. They're not just automatically ingested into the, the cell that is L&D and then some output is created because you end up doing a lot of work that's completely wasted. Um, and now that we've spoken about the elephants in the room, Paul, we're going to move on to the final part of the show, which is my favourite part, which is the <laughs> quick fire questions. Um, essentially, I get to throw a bunch of questions at you and, and hopefully, uh, you know, it can be a fast and short answer. But if you do want to elaborate on anything, feel free to, to, to do so. Um, so are you ready for the quick fire round? Um, no. <laughs> All right, let's go for it. Um, so one thing l and teams can do today to improve uh, learning and performance at their company. Think about the elephants in the room. Because that each of those elephants, all four of them, should have lines and mentions in your L&D strategy. So revisit your strategy and make sure the elephants are catered for in your strategy. Um, yeah. And, and Paul, you're obviously an incredible public speaker. You know, we, we've watched your videos. I've spoken to people, I've <laughs> to your you. talks. It, it's obviously a, a very natural, uh, but it comes very natural to you. So, but what is a top tip that you would give um, to someone who wants to improve uh, their public speaking and, and be more engaging as a public speaker? Um, practice, do it often. I mean, I didn't used to be, I used to hate, I, I was scared of it, quite frankly. I had a form of, well, not, not a phobia, but close to it. I really didn't like getting up. And it was just years and years of just getting up and slightly bigger and I've done crowds of thousands now and it's fine, I, you know. People say, aren't you nervous? And I said, well, no, <laughs> I kind of, that's all gone. Um, and sometimes I almost have to kind of get myself fired up to in order to go out there to, to generate some energy. So I think really it's just practice, get feedback. There's a heap of stuff online um, to, to, to do. And, and, and if you really want to get speaker, there's various speaker bureaus and, you know, groupings like that where you can start yeah. watching other people that do it well. I'm going off schedule here, Paul, but I know you've spoken about the, the kind of power of storytelling and, and you obviously do that really well um, in your speaking events. And that kind of art of building the story, um, beyond practice, what's helped you develop that kind of skill of storytelling? Um, I, I do remember have, joining a little group of people. We got together once every couple of months and told each other stories. And effectively, what you can do is start practicing a story until it's just kind of by rote letter perfect. You kind of know it off by heart and you can tweak it a little bit. And if you've got a, a dozen different stories that have different points, you can string them together in different ways. And, you know, so you get this kind of repertoire. Um, yeah. And so now, you know, I, I can just kind of do it off that repertoire and speak for yeah. hours literally. So, yeah. So and that, but that just comes with the practice. It's it's about doing it a lot, yeah. even if all you're doing it to is your guinea pigs or your your dog. You know, it's yeah. it's all about practice. 
which is something you talk about a lot, actually, which we didn't get a chance to speak about. Maybe we do a part two, uh, you know, the, the kind of learning, the, the learning by doing. And, and that's a kind of another area that you, you've kind of spoken about, um, which we didn't touch on. But the, the next quick five for you is what's the one skill that you'd like to develop and why? Oh, that's a really interesting one. I'm very intellectual. I probably need to get more in touch with my feelings. Okay. Okay. If you want a yeah. personal answer to that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, next one is what's one great thing you've learned from a, a colleague or someone you've worked with? Um, I think from my business perspective, someone told me a long time ago every business is a marketing business, it's just they happen to have a product or service. Right. Uh, that was a little bit of wisdom that I have ignored too often and, and, <laughs> and sometimes remembered. Um, but yeah. Great. And um, what's the one book that's not written by you uh, that you would recommend to someone who's working within the, the people function? So HR and the. Um, I'd probably get a hold of Dr. Ina Weinbauer Heidel's book on learning transfer. Um, I mentioned it in my book, and and but she's developed twelve levers. Twelve levers model of learning transfer as a result of doing her PhD on it. So she's yeah. read pretty much every bit of literature there is in the world on learning transfer, and pulled yeah. it all together, and and then collated it, and ended up developing this twelve lever model. Uh, so I'd highly recommend her and her work uh, on learning transfer. Yeah, great, brilliant, brilliant book and brilliant model. And um, so what's you know, the L&D trend that you think will, you know, pick up in the next year or two and will really start to be noticed? Huh. In a sense, I don't care. Um, <laughs> a lot of people focus on the future. I think there's plenty we can do, right? It's the old 80-20 rule. And yeah. if you keep chasing the bright, shiny new objects, you end up not. So I tend to avoid chasing i just want really basic simple i'm a simple farm boy from new zealand i want to do stuff that works and so just because something is trending or new there's so many things that have trended and whenever this is the latest best thing this is this i mean think remember things like second life and i mean there's been so many different stuff bits yeah. that have come in and people aren't even doing the basics right and i think yeah. that's important i i played basketball um in in, in college and in, in, in university and we were um, a, a very high uh, professional coach, basketball coach from the US was visiting New Zealand and he just happened to visit our college and, and said, you know, I'll, I'll come and do a training session for you. So we said, this is great. Yeah. And so we were all there and, and he said, okay, what should we do? And, and several of them said, you know, my colleague said, you know, we do this fancy bit, we want to do these plays. And he said, no, let's start with basic dribbling. Yeah. And he took us through some really basic skills. And this is one of the top college basketball coaches in the US. And I find the same thing in learning and development is just go and talk about the basics is they're often just not there in yeah. enough strength. And so trying to chase the bright, shiny new fashion is just not the right thing to be doing. And so let me flip that question from a perspective of, do, do you see the any kind of lasting change um, as a result of, of, of COVID and, and, and the way we're now working, you know, how much of it do you think, obviously, organisations have been forced to um, reevaluate the way they were doing learning programmes, whether that's in classroom and going online, maybe they're um, kind of reevaluating the way they're going to upskill and reskill their people. But do you see any of this being real lasting change or, or do you see this as kind of a temporary because of the way we've been forced to work now. And, you know, once we go back to any kind of normality, people are going to revert back to old habits. How do you see that? Well, I think there's a lasting change in terms of the remote nature of a lot of delivery. I think um, it's a bit like Kurt Lewin's model. You've got to unfreeze stuff before you can change it and then freeze it again. And what's happened is learning and development got unfrozen real fast about last yeah. March. And suddenly what was happening was no longer possible. And also that meant that the senior management teams couldn't just say, just put them in the classroom, get on with it and do it because they now couldn't say that and they didn't know what else to say. So they were actually in a position of relying on L&D to come up with alternatives. And that's meant that L&D 
inherited a whole lot of power as a result of COVID, sadly, very few L&D departments have really taken that power of, of suggestion they've got to suggest new ways of developing L&D. Sadly, not many have picked up on that. Yes, they've gone virtual, but they've sort of done it under duress uh, in many cases. What yeah. I have seen certainly is people converting um, what used to be face-to-face -face into online and now saying, oh my God, this actually works better. We've got clients that have done that with, on, yeah. our, on our platform and saying, well, actually we should have done this years ago. Damn it, why didn't we, you know, we, but of course that wasn't where their head was at. So yeah. Yeah. I think the proportion or the number of hours of training that is done in, next, in, in the coming years will be less, a lot less than it's been. I think it will yeah. drop to below 50%. Right. Right. There'll be a there'll be a, um uh, there'll be a snapback. People, oh, we get back in the classroom, yay! I don't think yeah. that'll happen for a while because I mean, what do you do with the people who are not vaccinated or whatever? So it's going to be yeah. potentially years before we actually get to any kind of place where we can reliably go back to the classroom in the yeah. same way that we were. And in fact, talking with people in countries that have had minimal lockdown, I'm a Kiwi originally, so I'm talking with people in New Zealand, and they're actually saying in some ways. They they're, they're back and doing training as normal, right. and they're saying we're we're going to suffer long term from that because we're not developing the online skills that the rest of the world is, right. and that means the rest of the world can come hunting in our backyard with online courses and we won't be able to compete. That's so there's point, some yeah. interesting other views yeah. around what's right and what's not. So sure. I think there'll be a lot less training. I think people um, are getting much more used to the idea of self-directed learning, of learning stuff when they need it for themselves at the time. Yeah. This is this whole informal learning thing. So that's going to make a big change. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of different stuff happening. And yeah. who knows where those change, changes will end up longer term. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And um, my last one on the quickfire rounds, Paul, is, you know, what's the one skill do you think um, it's important for L and D to start developing consultancy skills? Right. I think people often talk about data, but I, I think we we have enough data skills to kind of skim the top of it and get a sense of what's going on. But there's so much more basic stuff that we can do by talking mm -hmm. to the business in a way that the business can relate to, and doing yeah. that performance consultancy and all of that up front. And that will sidestep a huge amount of stuff that we're doing right now that we don't need to do and shouldn't be doing. When we get that right, then we can start getting into the measurement a lot more. Because if you're just measuring rubbish that's not working yeah. very well, you end up saying, well, that's not working very well, but it still doesn't help you do anything better. Yeah. You know? um, so, so, so I'm, I, it's not that I'm against data. I'm just thinking there's other things that L&D needs to focus on right now, given where it's yeah. at, that are lower hanging fruit let's say than the data yeah paul it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and like i said i can carry on going and i can probably book you in for a few more uh shows but paul it's been um absolute joy and there's so much to unpick there uh but thank you very much for your time and thanks once again for coming on the show oh you're very welcome though it's been great having a chat and there you have it our excellent elephant based chat with paul matthews comes to an end if you'd like to know more about Paul, his books and anything else, check out the links in the show notes. And if you want to share any feedback and ask any questions about the episode, you can find the relevant social channels and links in the show notes too. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do think about subscribing, sharing and leaving us a review or telling a friend. It goes a long way in helping the show grow. Thanks and see you next time.